And I want you to turn to Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6. Now, if you've been with us over the last few months, we have been working our way through the book of Ephesians and we have arrived at Ephesians chapter 6 this morning. And kids, at this point in our service, what I normally do is give you a preview of what I'm going to talk about in the sermon. And some of you stay in the sermon and some of you go to Sunday school and that's fine, but you're going to get a little window into the sermon. Now, I want to tell you an exciting thing. Lucy, if you can move on the slide. There is a part in Ephesians where God, because God is the author of the Bible, right? So God is the one who is speaking the words of the Bible. And there is a part in Ephesians 6 where God speaks directly to children. Okay, so kids, this bit is where God in his word is saying, right, listen, everybody needs to listen to this. But if you're a child, if you are looked after by an adult, then this is for you. Okay, if you can hear and understand, these words are for you. And it's Ephesians chapter 6, verses 1 and 2. So, now I want to ask you, what is God saying to children this morning in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 1? He is giving you a clear instruction. Nala read it for us. What is the clear instruction that God gives to children in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 1? If you're sat near a parent, they will be only too happy to tell you what God says to you this morning. What does he say in Ephesians chapter 6 verse 1 to all the children in the room? Yes, obey your parents, that's right. Isn't that exactly what you wanted to hear God say to you this morning? Obey your parents. Now, he gives you a reason. Why is it, children, that you should obey your parents? He gives you a reason because it is something. What's the reason that he gives? Let's have someone else, maybe. Let's have somebody else. Maybe your brother. You can whisper the answer to your brother. Yes. Because it's right. Okay? Here's the thing, children. God says you should obey your parents because it is the right thing for you to do. Do you... Do you always want to obey your parents? No, but it is always the right thing to do to obey your parents, even when you don't want to. Obviously, as long as they're not asking you to do something wrong, you know, something immoral or wrong, then don't listen to them. But if they are, their parents are allowed to tell you what to do and it is right for you to listen to them. But it comes with a promise, doesn't it? What's the promise? So children obey your parents because it's the right thing to do. It comes with a promise. What's the promise? Yes. I'll give you a bit of time to think about it. It's all right. Brilliant. So that it may go well with you. Yeah. Now he's quoting here from the Old Testament, isn't he? This is, this is one of the Ten Commandments that he's quoting. Honor your father and mother. It's the first commandment with a promise so that it may go well with you that you may enjoy long life on the earth. Now, I'm going to talk more about this in the sermon, but listen, kids, here's the reason to obey your parents. It's safe. It's safe. Imagine a parent tells a child, don't run into the road or you will get run over. What's the safest thing for that child to do? Obey their parents. Yeah, it will go well with them if they obey their parents. If they don't obey their parents, it will not go well with them. Now listen, children, this morning, I want you to put your hand up if you have always obeyed your parents. Put your hand up if you have always obeyed your parents. My children are definitely not going to put their hands up right now, okay? <laughs> Jeremiah put it up for a brief flash, but his dad made him put it down again, okay? <laughs> Now, now, that means, doesn't it, that every single person in this room, because let's just ask the adults as well. Adults, when you were small, did you always obey your parents? No, okay? That means that every single person in this room is in exactly the same boat. We, are, we have all not done what God has asked us to do. Now, that means we're all in trouble, doesn't it? 
But if you look down at the next verse, at verse four, fathers are not supposed to exasperate their children. Instead, they're supposed to teach them something, which is what? What are they supposed to teach children? What are fathers supposed to teach children? Is your hand up or are you just doing a dance? Okay. They're supposed to teach them something. Fathers are supposed to teach their children something. Any fathers in the room want to tell me what you should be teaching your children? The what of the what? Brilliant. Thanks, John. Training and instruction of the Lord. Yeah. And what is the training and instruction of the Lord? It's to say sorry for your sin and trust in Jesus, which is the answer for every single lawbreaker in the room, which we've decided is all of us, yeah? So the thing that you're supposed to hear from your parents is not only are you supposed to obey them, you're supposed to hear from them this great news that if you turn from your sin and trust in Jesus, he will forgive you. And that's brilliant news, isn't it? So let's pray. I ask God that he'll help you guys at Sunday school as you learn uh, more about him, and then uh, we'll pray for us as well as we listen to God's word in the sermon. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you that you speak so clearly in your word, the Bible, and you say things which are difficult for us to obey. Lord, you tell children that they should obey their parents. It's the right thing to do. It's the safe thing for them to do. But all of us in this room have failed to do that. So thank you too that you teach us this great news of Jesus, that he died in our place, that we might be forgiven for breaking your rules. Please, we pray as our children go to Sunday school this morning, help the teachers to teach them clearly and faithfully that they may hear this brilliant news. And pray for the rest of us as we listen to your word read and preached, that you might speak to our hearts, that you might move us to love, love you more and want to live for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. The rest of you, grab your Bibles again and turn to Ephesians chapter 6, and Gloria is going to come and read Ephesians chapter 6, verses 1 to 9 for us. Good morning, church. Praise the Lord for a wonderful Sunday. Now, um, Ephesians 6, 1 to 9. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother which is the first commandment with a promise, so that it may go well with you and that you may enjoy long life on the earth. Father, do not exacerbate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. Slaves, obey your earthly masters with respect and fear, with a sincerity of heart, just as you would obey Christ. Obey them not only to win their favor when their eyes are on you, but as slaves of Christ, doing the will of God from your heart. Serve wholeheartedly as, as if you are serving the Lord, not people, because you know that the Lord will reward you, reward each one for whatever good they do, whatever they, they are slaves, whether they are slaves or free, sorry. And masters, treat your slaves in the same way. Do not threaten them, since you know that, that, you, that he who is both their master and yours is in heaven, and there is no favoritism with him. Praise the Lord. Thanks so much, Gloria. Well, keep that passage um, open in front of you, and uh, we're going to work our way through it. Uh, together now. If you've just joined us, you are here visiting, we have been working our way through the book of Ephesians and we are uh, coming to the end. I think I've got two, maybe three more sermons in the book of Ephesians. It's very uh, popular, I think, for Christians to live their lives as, as, as if there is a divide between the sacred and the secular. The idea is that God is interested in, in some things and there are other things where, frankly, it makes very little difference if you're a Christian or not. So, for example, we are, we are led to believe, aren't we, that, that God is, is present with us. He's interested when we gather as a church, uh, when we maybe go to church youth group or when we're reading our Bibles. Those things are the, the sacred things. But when you're doing your maths homework or when you find yourself in a detention or when you're flipping burgers at work or when you're just waiting for the bus, 
Uh, those things, well, it makes zero Christ difference that you're a Christian. Those things are just secular. Now, now, let me say to you right from the very beginning this morning that that idea that there are some things which are sacred and other things that are secular, the Bible says that that distinction is wrong. It's wrong. We're going to see that together in our passage this morning. But as we start, I want to show you that despite it being wrong and obviously wrong from Ephesians 6, it is also popular, very popular. Why is it so popular to divide our lives and our world into sacred and secular? Well, for a start, I think for Christians, it makes it easy for us to be lazy, doesn't it? If I can say that there's a whole area of our lives where we don't really have to think very hard about what it means to be a Christian, if being a Christian doesn't make a very big difference at work or at the bus stop or washing up at home, then I just only have to think about it, do I? But also, I think the other reason is that we live in a city and at a time when people are super happy for us to be Christians, just as long as we keep it in a little box called sacred, as long as we keep it to ourselves. You know, you can be a Christian in London today as a, as a doctor, a teacher, a gas engineer, or a taxi driver. You can be a Christian in all those settings as long as you keep it to yourself, please. And don't let it affect your work. Now, in a large part, the church has been happy to play along with this sacred secular divide, retreating into the safe sacred space of a Sunday and leaving people alone for the rest of the week. And you know that's true, don't you? You know that the church has done that because I am almost certain that you have never heard a sermon on what it means to be a Christian classroom assistant or a Christian care worker or a Christian IT engineer or a Christian grandparent on childcare duties. That's an till today and you're going to hear a sermon on all those things let me start this morning though by showing you how paul rips up that sacred secular divide showing us in effect that the christian life is is all sacred we live all of it in the presence uh, of the lord jesus and start with me back in ephesians chapter 5 verse 17 because this is where this section that we are in starts he says in ephesians 5 verse 17 therefore do not be foolish but understand what the Lord's will is. Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. If you like, this is Paul's headline for everything that's going to, going to follow, including the stuff that we're looking at this morning. The Christian, who is the one saved not by their own good works, but saved by the work of Christ on the cross, the one who was dead in their sin, but is now alive in Christ, that person, says Paul, is not to be foolish. They're not to be foolish. Instead, the opposite of being foolish is understanding the will of the Lord. A will, which it turns out is not so much about who you're going to marry or what job you're going to do or where you should go to school or where you're going to live. Instead is verse 18, the will of the Lord is don't get drunk and act in stupid ignorance and wickedness, but be full of the Spirit. Be full of the Spirit. Now, what does it look like for you to live a life full of the Spirit? Well, keep going in chapter 5, look down at verse 19. Speaking to one another with psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit, sing and make music from your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Put simply, the will of God for your life is for you to turn up at church and participate vocally in what's going on for the encouragement and blessing of others. That's what life by the Spirit looks like. That's what the wise life looks like. Now, maybe you're thinking, wait a minute. That sounds like the sacred secular divide, Steve. I knew it. Paul is all into that, isn't he? No, he's not. There's more, isn't there? Because when Paul wrote verse 19 of Ephesians chapter 5, he didn't then hit return between verses 20 and 21. He didn't do that. That's your Bible translator that did that. Verse 21 carries on this life full of the Spirit. And what is that life like? Well, he says this, verse 21, submit. Literally here, it's a, to use a bit of grammar, it's a passive participle. It's not an imperative. This is something that is happening, not something that you're told to do. Submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. Life by the Spirit, the will of God for you, if you're a Christian this morning, is a life which joins in vocally at church and is the life of mutual submission. You see that? Mutual submission, which is seen, yes, in the life of the church, but also in these verses that follow, 
in marriage, in home, and in work. Let me just try and put this all together because I might have jumbled you up a bit this morning. The Christian, the one transformed by the Lord, full of the Holy Spirit, that person lives a life that is not just holy in the sacred places of a Sunday, but is lived in every place, every day of the week. So they live a holy life in church, yes, but also in marriage or singleness, in relationship with their parents or their children, with their bosses at work, with the people who work for them. In other words, if you think or you're tempted to believe that, that you can separate out the sacred from the secular, that, that being a Christian is basically saying a prayer on your own and believing some things in your heart, but carrying on with life like everybody else does, if that's what you think a Christian is, Paul says, no, no. Being a Christian is about being given a whole new life by God. A life that you receive by faith, that you could not earn, that you don't deserve, that is yours by the Spirit dwelling in you, and you live that life every day of the week, in every place you're put, at work, at school, at home. You see, although we experience God's presence in a special way when we gather as church, the truth is the Spirit is with us just as much tomorrow as we walk through the door of work or we sit on the bus scrolling our phone. And you see that over and over in our passage. So you glance down at our passage this morning from verse 1 of chapter 6. And let me show you. Just notice some of the detail here. Notice he says that the children's attitude to their parents is shaped, notice what? Verse 1, in the Lord. Or verse 4, that it's the instruction of the Lord that shapes parenting. In verse 5, slaves are to obey like they would obey Christ. So that their work, verse 6, whatever it is, their work becomes doing the will of God. A work that, verse 7, is serving the Lord, knowing, verse 8, that it's God who rewards our work in eternity. All work is Christian work for the believer. There is no sacred, secular divide in Ephesians. Now, before we go any further, let's just pause there just to notice how both profoundly challenging and encouraging that is. On the one hand, it is profoundly challenging, isn't it? It, it means... That if this morning, as you think about it, if there are areas of your life where it is making not a scrap of difference that you're a Christian, perhaps people at work have no idea that you're really a Christian, or you've never really thought that the Spirit is with you at school. Listen, that's a problem, a serious problem. Why? Well, because the will of the Lord is that it should make a difference. The will of the Lord is that the Spirit's life invades every place. And that's profoundly challenging, isn't it? But on the other hand, it's massively encouraging too. It means, doesn't it, as a Christian, you are never on your own. You are never on your own. It means it's not a, a burst pipe that you go to fix without Jesus being there with you. It, it means that you're, you're never at a hospital appointment where you're on your own and God is not present. There's never a bus ride that you're taking where you're on your own, because Christ is with you. All the world is Christ's. Every square inch of this planet belongs to him, and you are his new creation. Praise God. If you're a Christian this morning, that is you. Praise God for that. Now, with that in mind, let's have a look in a bit more detail at the specifics of these verses, verses 1 to 9. Let's start with children, who we've dealt with a little bit already. But I want you to look at it in a bit more detail, and it's great to have children in the room with us as we do it. Paul's assumption here seems to be that children are present, listening in the gathering of the church. Do you notice that? Now, if you think that church needs to send children out of the gathering in order for them to learn, then the news for you is that Paul doesn't seem to agree with you. Instead, Paul thinks that when children are old enough to understand what he's saying, they should be listening to what he's saying. And Paul says to those children, God says to those children, to you this morning, if you're a child, that you should obey your parents. And like we saw, they're to do this in the Lord, because this kind of obedience is part of the Christian life. And more than that, they are to do that because, as we saw again with the children, because it's right. In other words, children this morning, obeying your parents is right. It's what God wants you to do. Not obviously if what they're asking you to do is illegal or immoral. But rather, when your parents say to you, listen, switch the TV off, will you? And come for dinner. What do you do? You switch the TV off 
and you go for dinner. Listen, I think it's time that you went to bed now. Okay, I'll go to bed. I think it's time that you put that phone away and got on with your homework. Okay, mum, I'll put my phone away and get on with my homework. Why do I do that as a child? Because God says so. He says it's the right thing for you to do, even if it's not what you want to do. And Paul's authority for that, which he puts so bluntly, is because he's quoting the fifth commandment, isn't he? In verse two, honour your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise, so that it may go well with you and that you may enjoy long life on the earth. It's not super clear here what Paul means by the first commandment with a promise, because if you read through the Ten Commandments, the second commandment also seems to come with a promise. But there are several good options for what he might mean, and you can ask him one day when you meet him in glory. But the big idea is really clear. And that is that for you, obedience to your parents is good for you. It's the way of peace, of things going well, and safety, not an early grave. Obeying the instruction, like we saw earlier, not to run out into the road might just save your life. In other words, obedience to your parents, if you're a child this morning, is demanded of you to bless you, not to hurt you. While you don't always feel it, the truth is you will be happier, safer, and better off if you obey your parents rather than if you disobey them. And I could stand here this morning and give you countless examples of where that's true. And you could probably, if you're a child this morning, speak to any of the adults in the room over lunch and say, do you regret the times that you disobeyed your parents? And they would say, yes, I do. Now, children, I know this is not easy, but it's worth thinking, isn't it, that if you find that it is absolutely impossible for you to do this, if you find yourself in constant conflict with your parents, because you just can't seem to do what they ask of you to do. If you find yourself sort of in this corner where you don't really want to obey them, can I suggest to you that your problem might not be just a behavioral problem, but it might be a heart problem. That what you really need to do is to become a Christian. See, it's impossible, isn't it, for us to obey our parents. What does he say, verse one? in the Lord if we're not first trusting in the Lord. You know, don't listen to this this morning as a child and go home and go, I'm gonna try really hard to be good. Listen, that will be impossible for you. Instead, you come instead you come to Jesus first, don't you? And say that you're sorry for your sin and your failure. You need to tell Jesus first that you want him to be Lord of your life and then go home. And with the Spirit's help, I guarantee you that you will find a new joy in obeying your parents that you never had before, and that that new life by the Spirit will be way more fun than your old one. Parents, it's worth saying to you as an aside just on this section, that despite what the world tells you, it is okay if you have young children at home to tell them what to do, right? It's okay for you to expect your children to obey you. There's an implicit warning to parents here not to put the children in charge at home. The children at charge in home is a disaster. You wouldn't let them drive you in the car. Don't let them drive the rest of your life either. The best way for you to have happy kids is to expect them to obey you as you take responsibility to decide what's best for them. So that's children. Second, parents, verse four parents. The instruction here is given specifically to fathers, but the implication, I think, is that it's mothers included as well, especially given what we were seeing a couple of weeks ago at the end of chapter five. And parents are given one negative warning and one positive encouragement. The negative warning is profoundly challenging. Listen to this, parents. You are told, do not exasperate your children. Really, literally, the sense here in the Greek word is Do not lead your children into anger. Don't provoke them. Don't lead them into situations or back them into corners where you know that the likely outcome is that they will be cross with you and come at you in anger. Of course, that doesn't mean that parents are not to have any confrontation with their children, nor that they're not to uh, give them instructions. We've seen that already. Rather, the point is that you lead your children away from anger and not into it. It seems to me that the best way to understand this is to think about the atmosphere at home. A high conflict, high stress, high anger environment is not a good way to run a home, says Paul. 
And even though you might blame the children for that this morning, if you're a parent, still the challenging truth from Ephesians 6 verse 4 is, listen, you might blame the children, but Paul holds you responsible for it. Be careful about the atmosphere at home. But also positively, he says, you're to bring your children up in the training and instruction of the Lord. In other words, what he's saying is parents, if you're a parent this morning, you are responsible for the education of your children. You don't delegate the education of your children either to the school or to the church. Hopefully they attend both of those places, but the responsibility is still yours. It's your responsibility to open the Bible with them, to read it to them, helping them to find answers to their questions about faith and life and suffering. Knowing, and this is important to hear, isn't it? Knowing that there's no guarantee that your children will become Christians, that's not the promise, but rather you know that people become Christians how? How do people become Christians? Well, by being exposed to the gospel. And so you expose your children to the gospel as much as possible and as clearly as possible. It's worth, I think, just pausing on there for a moment and just thinking about that really clearly. My, my fear is that lots of Christian parents think that teaching their children about Jesus is some kind of trick to get them to behave well, right? Everyone wants their children to behave well. Maybe if I teach them about Jesus, this will be some kind of magic trick to, to get them to conform. So I beat them with Ephesians 6 verse 1. Or maybe we think that the really important thing is that our children can kind of pass some kind of Bible quiz, you know, where, where they're always the first to find the passage in the Bible. But that's not Paul's point, is it? The outbox of the instruction of the Lord is neither just information or knowledge, nor obedience. The outbox of in the instruction of the Lord is what? Repentance. Repentance. The instruction of the Lord is not how to find a book of the Bible. The instruction of the Lord is not how to behave well. The instruction of the Lord is how to deal with the fact that none of us do that. How do we find forgiveness? How do we find grace? Where can we get mercy? How can I know that God loves me? How can I come into a relationship with him? And I can't emphasize this enough. If you're a parent this morning, or if you're a Sunday school teacher, or, or if you have nieces or nephews or, or grandchildren, then listen, this is what we're trying to impress upon our children. Not the need for Bible trivia and good behavior, but repentance and faith. And if your children don't understand that, you need to rethink what you're saying to them. And again, this is not a guarantee that your children will become Christians or even live as Christians, if only you get this right. But, but what you can say is that your children will not become Christians if they don't know the gospel. You know that, don't you? We need to hear the gospel in order to become a Christian. Faith comes by hearing, says the Apostle Paul in Romans 10. You know, if we raise our children to think that they are uh, Christians by knowing Bible trivia and by being well behaved, what we've raised are not genuine believers, but Pharisees. You know that, don't you? Or maybe angry rebels, or perhaps even more likely, just cynical agnostics who think the Christian life is unrealistic and boring. Now, I know that the majority of people in this room don't have young children anymore. Most of us are too old. Some of us have grandchildren, some of you have nieces and nephews or great nieces and nephews. And I think for you this morning, the, the emphasis of Ephesians 6, although it's not directly speaking to you, is saying, listen, do all that you can within your power to see that the children under your influence hear the good news of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, whether that's through supporting their Christian parents or giving thoughtful presence or simply praying and being willing to speak up, commit yourself to doing that, won't you? I know others of you in this room are still living with your children, but they are no longer under your care in the way that Paul assumes in Ephesians 6 verse 1. And I think it's worth thinking for you, what does it mean for you if you have adult children living in the home? And for you, I think it would be wrong for you to insist on the kind of obedience that Paul outlines in Ephesians 6 verse 1. But still it's true that you don't have to tolerate everything. Still, you want to make the gospel clear to your children because you are still a Christian parent. And I think maybe most profoundly, if you have adult children living in the home, you are still responsible for the atmosphere at home. 
And I think if anything, with adult children, that matters even more, doesn't it? As we're no longer able just to sit our children down and tuck them into bed with a Bible story, but now it is the atmosphere at home. It's our responses to things that happen, which model and demonstrate the gospel to our children, our adult children. Thirdly then, slaves, verses five to eight. As we come to this, it's worth saying right at the outset that Paul is not talking about the 18th and 19th century slavery, which shaped so many of the lives in this room. Slaves, as Paul talks about it here, are not those who were taken against their will or shipped across oceans in terrible conditions. That did happen, but Paul is not talking about that here. Instead, the word slave here, doulos in the Greek, is really, I think, doubling up as a catch-all word for worker. So slaves in the first century, now listen, slavery in the first century was not all, you know, sweetness and light, don't get that impression, but it, it was different to 18th and 19th century slavery. But slaves in the first century could be owned by the state. In Athens, slaves owned by the state were the police force. Or you could be a slave because you were paying off a debt. You sold your labor to pay off a debt like a mortgage or even a crime maybe. You could be in some kind of household slavery where one family exchanged service for another family in order to find a place to live and food. Now, not all of it is noble, not all of it was moral. We don't need to pretend that. But Paul is not talking about the system here. And actually, when he does talk about the system, he tells slaves to try and get their freedom. But Paul is not talking about the system here, but rather talking about what our attitude should be to whatever it is that we have to do in order to put food in our mouths and a roof over our heads. And he says that that involves working to please the Lord and not our bosses. Because we are to see what he says, we're to see obedience at work as obedience to Christ. Again, not of course, if they expect us to do something against God's law, but rather, and this is the important bit, the dignity of work is not the end product that we produce, but the fact that it is an expression of love for Jesus and a desire to please him. Now that has profound implications, doesn't it? It means this morning, cleaning floors is as dignified as saving lives. Caring for children with all their messiness is as dignified as it is writing sermons to preach on a Sunday. And that's because verse six, I don't only work when I'm being watched, but also when I'm not, which I think is perhaps particularly pertinent in our work from home era, right? Where by definition, no one is watching you. But even there, I work hard because Jesus by his spirit is working from home with me. And the work like this, whatever it is, is doing the will of God, verse six. So that verse six and seven, putting my heart into it, getting involved, doing a good job, is not only pleasing to God in a kind of passive, not disobeying sense, but also verse eight is rewarded by him in eternity. Do you see that? It's worth noting, isn't it? And just pausing on this and hearing what Paul is saying. Notice he's not saying that it's only gospel work that's rewarded in eternity. We can think like that, can't we? You, know, you can think that your day job is like a cover for evangelism. You're like a kind of secret agent on a mission to do evangelism. Shh, don't tell anybody. And God's only pleased with the secret agent work. It's not that, is it? Actually, sharing the gospel at work is a really brilliant thing to do, and you should do it when you get opportunity. But Paul's concern is not for that here, is it? Rather, he thinks you should do a good job on every aspect of your work. You know, that report that you've got to write, even though probably no one's going to read it, still do a good job of it. It's God's will that you do a, God, a good job of it, and God will notice and reward you. That extra mile that you go at work to clear up that mess or to rise above the backstabbing and the gossip, that was unnoticed by everyone. No one, no one noticed that, did they at all? But God saw it. He was pleased with it. That courage that you had to speak up about an immoral practice or about a colleague who was being mistreated, it wasn't really appreciated by the boss who then had to sort it out, but it was seen by the Lord. The fact that at work you don't steal time, you don't steal equipment, that you're a person of your word, that you do what you say you're going to do and you do it when you say you're going to do it, all of that is God's will for you and will be rewarded by him. Now, tantalizingly, how do you think he's going to reward that? What's that going to look like? I honestly don't know. I don't know. We're only given the vaguest hints in God's word. But let me tell you, it's brilliant. 
And listen, this is the point for you and I. We're to go into work tomorrow, whatever it is that we're doing, whether we're paid for it, whether it's volunteering, whether it's looking after children at home, or whether it's going out to work to, to earn a living, whatever we are doing tomorrow, we're to be really excited by it, thrilled by it, because tomorrow, just as much as today, as we roll up our sleeves to cook a meal or to run some errands or to scrub a toilet bowl, whatever it is, we have the opportunity to please God and be rewarded by him in glory. Isn't that fantastic? Isn't that fantastic? And while you and I might not get the recognition at work that we would like to, still, we will one day. We will one day. So press on. Finally, Masters, verse 9. Is there anyone else getting colder and colder in this room? Is that, is that just me? Liz, is the back door open? Is that door open? Can you close it, please? Because it's like Baltic in here, which is great because it means you're all wide awake. But Neva, who's cooking us all dinner, is about to freeze. And that's going to be a bad thing for all of us, isn't it? Masters, verse 9. Let me just read verse 9 to you as we come to look at it. And masters, treat your slaves in the same way. Do not threaten them since you know that he who is both their master and yours is in heaven, and there is no favoritism with him. That, I think, would have been astonishing to Paul's first readers. It's astonishing to us today if you just take a moment to think on it. Because Paul says that, listen, if you're a boss at work, it makes not a scrap of difference to how God sees you. You know that, don't you? If you, if you find yourself as someone who's really important at work, everybody loves the important people at work, don't they? They get treated differently, but not by God. It doesn't make a scrap of difference to how God sees you. Your importance at work does not impress God. Responsibility for others is not a sign that you are living a blessed life. A high salary is no indication of an eternal reward. Instead, if you're a boss this morning, what you're to remember is that actually, despite all of that adulation that you might get at work, you are still only ever a sinner saved by grace. And you are on exactly the same footing as every single person who works for you. So don't threaten people. Don't bully people. Don't lord your power over other people. The world loves to do that, doesn't it? The Apprentice is based on that, if you've been watching that TV show. But the Christian, work, work, uh, Christian doesn't work like that. Why? Well, because actually we all recognize that we are under God's authority. And so we behave as if we are. One of the great things about church is the diversity of people and occupations in the room. In this room this morning, we have retired people. We have children. We have students, doctors, nurses teachers, teaching assistants, drivers, gas fitters, finance people, cleaners, IT bods, charity workers, soon to be probation workers, right? Marketing workers, maintenance managers, people who have described their jobs to me multiple times and I still have no idea what exactly it is that they do, people. There are lots of other things too. But whoever you are this morning and whatever you're doing tomorrow, Paul wants you to know that it is sacred. It's sacred. You should do it for the Lord because he's interested, he's watching, and is glorified as you do it in his name. Let me pray, and then we'll sing together. Let's pray. Father, I want to pray that you might forgive us that so often we have lived our lives in these two boxes, one of sacred and one of secular, as if there are areas of our lives which you're not interested in. Forgive us for that, because it's nonsense, Lord. You are with us in every moment of every day. We live our Christian lives in your presence for your glory, wherever we are and whatever it is that we're doing. Please help us to remember that, we pray. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.